life. We call it the Passion Week, of course, the great week of emotion and passion as he dealt with the events of the last week. <clears throat> and this morning we're going to look at something that was not on my outline. I think we need to look at some things this morning, so this is off the, off the script. We're in Matthew 21 in just a moment. <clears throat> We see Jesus in this last week in a conundrum, in confrontation with the Jewish leaders, these righteous Pharisees that had the power, had the common people by the throat, so to speak, that ruled their lives and ruled the worship in the temple and everything, and called the shots on everything. And Jesus has this tension build as he teaches and talks with them these last day or two of his life. And we see throughout all this, he teaches his followers as he confronts the Jewish leaders. And we'll take a, a, a small detour this morning to look at some of these, these interactions and how we saw him react. And maybe that would help us to react as well in life. Whenever we uh, begin this morning, let's, let's remember that you know, Jesus has come into Jerusalem. Uh, his feet was an, were anointed by Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Uh, had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the little donkey. And Jesus was proclaimed Messiah by the crowd and they brought sick people to him and he healed them there. And it was very obvious that he was a, a special man. Last week we talked about people coming to, to see him and talk to him and repeatedly he says you've got to count the cost if you're going to follow me. You've got to count the cost. And so as we Again, this morning, uh, we read in Scripture that even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. These Jews, these hard-hearted, cold-hearted Jewish leaders were so addicted to their power that even though they saw, saw this man heal the sick before their very eyes, would not believe. And scripture says it's just like having ears that can't see, uh, ears that can't hear, and eyes that can't see, and hearts that can't believe. The last call, we would say, and Jesus called them one more time, come to me. Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. See, these Jewish leaders had such control over things that if anyone believed in this man Jesus as Messiah, they could be thrown out of the synagogue. And so some people secretly believed that they couldn't admit it in public. And that's bad. Now, in Matthew 21, we'll take a, just a, a high point hit here, here and there on a few things about how Jesus interacts with these people. In, uh, in our situation here, we'll begin with uh, chapter 21, beginning with verse 23. Jesus has cleansed the temple. And he ruffled some feathers, to, pull it, to put it mildly, when he cleansed the temple. And he did it deliberately, and we've, we've covered this already. And that's, that's enough of that. But the first question these Jewish leaders had for him is, who do you think you are to do this? What moral authority do you have to do this to our temple? What authority do you have to do this? And 
And so this is their attack to Jesus. In verse 23, Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you this authority? And Jesus replied, I'll also ask you a question. If you answer me, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or from man? Meaning the human order. They discussed it among themselves and said, well, if you say from heaven, he will ask, well, then why didn't you believe him? That is, John the Baptist. But if we say of human origin, then we're afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. In a nutshell, this gives us a picture of the back and forth that's going to happen here. They asked Jesus this question, who are you that you think you could come in here with authority and turn over the money changers table and all that? Tell us, Jesus. They asked him a question on this level and he answered it a little bit differently. He says, I'll give you one back. I'll ask you a question. If you'll answer my question, I'll answer your question. Was John the Baptist from God or from man? And they couldn't answer it. By, by wisdom, this is probably a very wise answer. They said, well, we just don't know. We just don't know. Because they were caught in a, bond, a, a box, caught in a bind. <clears throat> if they answer, well, from God, then Jesus is going to say, well, why didn't you follow John the Baptist? Believe it. But if it's uh, from man, then or, or if it was for God, why didn't you follow him? If it was man, then, you know, uh, still not a good answer. Jesus says, I won't tell you either. All right. Now, Jesus comes back with them, and he begins to tell us the parables. We're not going to look at the parables in depth. We've done that before in other classes. But he begins to make his point to these people. He says, let me tell you a story. He says, uh, a man owns a vineyard. He has two sons. He goes to one son and says, uh, go work in my vineyard today. And the son says, no, I won't. But later on, he begins to think about it and repent. He goes and works in the vineyard after all. The other son is told, go work in my vineyard. And he says, yeah, I'll go. But he doesn't go. And so Jesus says, which son is the better one? And they said, well, the first one that eventually went ahead and, you know, went and worked after all. Jesus said, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Meaning, these wicked people, sinful people, around these good Pharisees were entering the kingdom of God and working in the kingdom of God before these good Jewish leaders that thought they were so self-righteous. See, a tax collector was just another phrase for a, for a sinner because they were known cheats. And, and prostitutes as well, we know that situation. But he says... They are believing. They have believed. They repented, believed, and are entering the kingdom ahead of you. And that made them think. Okay. Jesus says, let me tell you another parable. A man has a vineyard and he fixes it up and gets it all ready and producing and he rents it out to sharecroppers, meaning farmers that work the land and at the end of the year, the landlord gets a certain share of the crop. End of the end of the season, the landowner, vineyard owner, sends his servants to get his share of the crop. And these farmers beat them up and kill them and run them off and all that, and don't give any share to the owner. 
Charlie Gummer says, I'll tell you what, they'll respect my son, so I'm going to send my son to go collect the rent. And they kill him. And then Jesus says, what about this owner of the vineyard? What is he supposed to do with these tenant farmers who are so wicked? And the Jews answered the question. They said, well, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end. He will rent the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him the share of the crop at harvest time. And Jesus said, have you never read that this stone, the cornerstone that was rejected, has now become the head of the corner? Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce it. See, Jesus told this parable. He asked the Jews this question. What should this vineyard owner do about this? And they fell in the trap. They answered the question. And Jesus says, okay, I got it. Haven't you ever read that the rejected stone is going to be the head of the corner now? And that God is going to take the kingdom away from you guys who reject it and give it to one who will produce fruit. It says in verse 45 of Matthew 21, he says, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. That's real plain. They looked for a way to arrest him, they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Jesus did not mince words. Jesus was very clear in telling these little stories, parables, to make his point. These chief priests and Pharisees knew Jesus was talking about them. God taking the kingdom that they thought they had a, had a lock on and giving it to these sorry tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners because they believed in him. Okay, we've got to get rid of this man Jesus, they said. We've got to. But they couldn't quite make their move yet because the common people knew that Jesus was Messiah couldn't have a riot go on at this time. So Jesus comes back with them again. He says, let me tell you another parable verse, in chapter 22. Uh, a king has a wedding feast for his son, has a great banquet, prepares all the food, and all the caterers are ready and everything. So he, the king tells the servants, all right, go invite the wedding guests to come. Now all things are ready. Come to the feast. The wedding guests that are invited just sort of ignore the invitation and keep on doing what they need to do with their, their lives. Nobody comes. So the king you know, tries again. Nobody comes. And finally the king says, you go to the street corners and you invite everybody, good or bad, to come. And so they do. And Jesus tells a story and he says, many are chosen, many are called very few choose to come. And they realize he's talking about them. All right, now the, the good Pharisees come back at Jesus. And they said, all right, we're going to set a trap for him. This is verse 15. And we'll set a trap for him. And they came up to Jesus and sort of uh, mm, buttered him up a little bit, uh, praised him and said, teacher, you know, we know that you're a man of integrity. And you teach the way of God very truthfully. We know that you're not swayed one way or other about what you think we should do. But you follow God. So we have this question for you. Is it right to pay <coughs> this Roman tax that we're supposed to pay? Now the Romans <coughs> were controlling over uh, Israel at that time. And if you were... <coughs> A Roman citizen, you didn't have to pay this tax, but all the 
uh, subjugated people had to pay this little tax. So their question to Jesus was, do we have to pay this tax? And that's a loaded question again. Uh, if we pay the tax to Caesar, or are we not being very good Jews? Are we, you know, compromising our Jewishness? And if we uh, don't pay the tax, they're in trouble of the Roman government getting on them, so what do we do? So Jesus, we all know this story, says, bring me a coin. He says, whose likeness is on this coin? And they said, Caesar's. He says, all right, you render to Caesar what's Caesar's, and you render to God what's God. Brilliant answer. It says in verse 22, when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Okay. A little later that day, another group came to deal with Jesus. And these were the Sadducees. They were um, another political party of these ruling Jews. We had the Pharisees over here, Sadducees. And the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. So they made up this story. Okay, Jesus, uh, answer our question. What about heaven? Even though they didn't really believe in resurrection into heaven, they said, we have this theoretical story. We need an answer to it. A lady was married and, and everything was fine, but her husband died. And so a brother married her. And sure enough, they come out total seven brothers in this family, and they all seven brothers uh, died uh, one after the other after they had married this one woman. One after another. So they asked him, all right, in heaven, then whose husband will be the husband of this wife? She had seven husbands and all brothers. And Jesus was frustrated and he said, you're missing the point. God is the God of the living, not the dead. You don't worry about that. There's, we aren't married or given in marriage in heaven. Don't worry about that. And it says in verse 33, when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Okay? Fair enough. Absolutely. So the, the Jews came after Jesus again, and they said, okay, now, hearing that Jesus had silenced uh, the Sadducees, the Pharisees came back at him and said, all right, we have a question for you. Teacher, what's the greatest commandment of the law? And that's a, a, a question that they worried about quite a bit. They, they ranked all their laws and, and made so sure that they followed them all that they could. So, uh, teacher, Jesus, uh, what's the greatest commandment? And I'm sure they knew that whatever he answered, they could come back at him and try to try to tie him in a knot. So he said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all your heart, strength, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. On this, it's all, all the law and the prophets sums it all up. Excellent answer. Jesus came back at them and said, all right, let me ask you one. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? And he dealt with that. And they said, well, he's just the son of David, meaning a descendant of the great King David, which Jesus was. And Jesus tied him in a knot there through Scripture. And finally, in verse 46, it says that no one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The back and forth. Question here, question there. Jesus would answer a question that they didn't ask. But every time he answered, he upped the ante a little bit and pointed to what they were really trying to make him say. And he tied them in a knot every time. And they were steaming. They were seething mad. And you see the tension build. Question there goes back and forth. 
brilliance of Jesus as he teaches. Now, in chapter 23, he tears into the Jewish leaders and he just rips the bark off of them. And let me just briefly go over these in chapter 23. He says, you be careful of these people, these Pharisees. Don't do what they do because they do not practice what they preach. They tie heavy, heavy loads on people, <coughs> burdens on them, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to help them. They have these fancy garments on. They love to be respected in the marketplace and be called by great names. But he says, let me tell you, the greatest among you will be your servant. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And then beginning in verse 13 of chapter 23, he has seven blistering woes or condemnation upon these Pharisees. Seven unmistakable accusations and condemnations of the Pharisees. And he does not mince words here. Beginning with verse 13, I'll just briefly go over. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you Hypocrites, and a hypocrite, of course, is someone who acts differently than what they truly are. You shut the door in the face of people who are trying to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's our figure of speech. Even today, you know, you, we, our, our term, we slam the door in somebody's face. Not only is, is it sort of a physical uh, understanding, but it's representative of Somebody's blocking your way on purpose. He says, you have slammed the door in people's faces that were trying to enter the kingdom. And then he says, woe to you again. You travel over land and sea to try to, try to find a convert. And then we, when you make them a convert, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Okay. Then he says, you blind guides. Guys are supposed to be people that can show us the way and help us along. He says, you're blind. And he talks about how you finagle your, your oath, your swearing, so that you can get out of what you swear to do. 23, he says, woe to you again, teachers of the law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You, you tithe. You give your 10% to God <clears throat> of your little spices, that you grow in your garden, your mint, your dill, your cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Now you should have practiced, yes, the latter without neglecting the former, the, the little stuff as well. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, the swallow. They were so dil diligent that they would, you know, they were supposed to give 10% of their proceeds to the work there as a good Jew. They were so diligent and meticulous that even the little stuff that grew in their garden to flavor their food with, they would give 10% to the work of the Lord. And yet they would neglect justice and mercy. And he says, it's just like straining out a little speck, a little gnat, and yet you swallow a camel. This was a exaggerated humor on purpose to show the absurdity of what these Jewish leaders were doing. Verse 25, woe to you again. It's just like washing dishes, but you only do it halfway. You clean the outside of the cup and the dishes, but you don't clean the inside. Next, 
He says, it's just like seeing a beautiful uh, cemetery, a sepulcher, that's whitewashed and beautiful, but yet it's inside is full of dead bodies. That's the way you are. Verse 28, he says, in the same way on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And he speaks very plainly. Verse 29, he calls them hypocrites again, and he says, you build tombs to the prophets, and you take care of their graves, and, and they, you say, boy, if we'd have lived in the Old Testament times, when the prophets came, we wouldn't have killed them, we wouldn't have uh, harmed them and all that. But no, you would have too. You would have been part of it as well. Verse 33, he calls them a bunch of snakes. He says, you snakes, you brood of vipers. How can you escape being condemned to hell? And, you know, God sent prophet after prophet to warn you. But I tell you, all of the blood of the prophets is going to come upon this generation right now. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you. How I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you're not willing. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's it. He walks away. These seven scathing condemnations of the Pharisaical Jews. And they didn't mistake it. Now, we don't have any other interaction with the Jews as far as we can tell right now. The Jews left the temple, it says in verse 24. Jesus is left with his disciples. We're going to skip 24 and 25 because Jesus is talking to his disciples about the end times and all this kind of thing and several good parables. And that's not, not uh, pertinent to what we need to say. Let's turn to chapter 26, verse 1. And this is what Jesus says. Now, this is scripture. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, then he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the plate in the palace of the high priest, in whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed, they planned to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the the die was cast, the decision was made, those that were in authority of the Jews says we have to get rid of this guy. We've got to figure out how to sort of arrest him privately without causing a riot. We know there's a lot of people here coming in for Passover and we've got to be careful because these people think this guy Jesus is Messiah got to be careful. Jesus says two days and I'll be crucified. Now we use the word sometimes bookends, you know, the start and the finish. The very first scriptures we read just a while ago Jesus was asked by what authority do you do this? Who are you to come in here and cleanse our temple? And then we saw the back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. A few chapters later here in chapter 26. It's done. They got their answer by what authority. Jesus didn't say it in words. He showed it by his life, by parable after parable, condemnation after condemnation. Jesus had the moral authority to do whatever he needed to do because he was perfect. And we know this. They didn't. They, they thought he was of the devil, of course. But Jesus showed his authority morally to act. These 
Jews closed their minds, closed their hearts, and said, we've got to get rid of him. Jesus spoke plainly. And this started the path to the cross. Now, we can always say, and I've had people ask me, why, didn't, why did Jesus do this? Maybe he wouldn't have to been killed. No, this was God's plan. We know this. This was God's way. And we'll see over and over and over again. Jesus was surrendering to the will of the Father. And he caught as he was going down. You stand for what is right. You stand for the poor. You stand for the the helpless. You open the door for those who are searching for the kingdom. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And you don't tie burdens on people religiously to get them on your side so you can abuse them some more. You help people. Over and over we see Jesus confront this Jewish machine. And Jesus wins in the end after the resurrection. Can you imagine after Jesus was resurrected what these Jews thought? <laughs>